Welcome all. This is Dr. Hani Nadim. Uh, in this lecture, I will cover the anatomy of the heart. Uh, this lecture, as a matter of fact, is a combination of five different uh, lectures. Uh, the first one deals with the uh, pericardium. The second is external features of the heart. The third is internal structure of the heart. The fourth is about the coronary blood supply. And the fifth is about uh, the controls of the heart beating, whether uh, uh, myogenic or neurogenic. Uh, the first uh, part of this lecture deals with the anatomy of the pericardium. Uh, we will cover the following points, the layers, their function and the attachments, uh, the sinuses or recesses of the pericardium, the supply of the pericardium, whether uh, neurogenic or uh, vascular, and the clinical application of the pericardium, which is pericardiosynthesis. Uh, the pericardium is made of two layers, an outer tough fibrous layer called fibrous pericardium that helps to fix the heart and prevent its overexpansion, and an inner serous layer similar to the pleura and peritoneum that helps lubrication during contraction. The fibrous layer is fixed by blending above with the adventitia of the large blood vessels. It is fixed below uh, to the central tendon of diaphragm, and anteriorly it's fixed uh, to the back of sternum by two sternopericardial ligands. The only place where it is no fixation of the pericardium is the back and the two lateral sides. The serous pericardium is made of two layers, a visceral layer called the epicardium and is adherent to the surface of the heart and is considered as a part of the heart, and a parietal layer that is adherent to the fibrous layer and is considered as a part of the fibrous pericardium. Uh, the cavity between the two layers accommodates very little amount of uh, serous fluid, uh, which is about 15 to 20 ml. Uh, we have two recesses of the pericardium that are called pericardial sinuses, a transverse sinus and an oblique sinus. Regarding any sinus, uh, you need to know the boundaries and its function. Uh, first, the transverse sinus. This is a place uh, or a space located uh, behind the two big arteries that emerge from the heart, uh, the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Uh, on each side of these arteries, the atrium projects to form an auricle. If you put your finger, as this picture shows, uh, behind the two arteries, it is in the transverse sinus of pericardium. Uh, below, you are uh, uh, limited by the groove between the atria and ventricles. Behind, you will have the two atria hidden by the two big arteries. Above, there is reflection of pericardium from the anterior wall of the sinus to its posterior wall. Uh, so you can say uh, easily that anteriorly you have the arteries, posteriorly you have the atria. The second sinus is the oblique sinus of pericardium. It is actually a part of the pericardial cavity that is hidden behind the heart. Uh, it is limited on each side by two pulmonary veins. These are the two left pulmonary veins, and these are the two right pulmonary veins. On the right side also, we have the inferior vena cava. Uh, above, there is reflection of the parietal pericardium to the back of the heart and below it communicates with the rest of the pericardial cavity. To understand the uh, formation of these uh, sinuses, we have uh, to revise a little uh, part of the development of the heart. When very early the heart was in the form of an endocardial heart tube and a pericardial sac, at first they were separate from each other. Then the heart tube invades the back of the pericardial sac, carrying a visceral layer, leaving a parietal layer. As it's pushed inwards, it drags a double-layered fold behind it, 
called the dorsal uh, uh, mesocardium. Uh, later, the cells of the dorsal mesocardium uh, disappear, they die by apoptosis, and creating uh, a communication uh, behind the endocardial heart tube, which is covered by visceral pericardium. Through this hole or opening, uh, the two sides of the pericardial sacs communicate. And as the heart tube elongates, it, it becomes U-shaped, creating this recess between the arterial portion and the venous portion, or the input and the output. This will eventually, this site of absorbed dorsal mesocardium, will become the transverse sinus. It is located between the two ascending arteries, which are the aorta and pulmonary trunk, and the two atria behind. It's between the two arteries anteriorly and the two atria posteriorly. As the uh, heart tube elongates furthermore, it becomes S-shaped, creating a part of the pericardial sac that is located behind, behind the atria here. So this part that is hidden is the oblique sinus of pericardium. So we can easily say that the atria intervene, especially the left one, intervenes between the transverse sinus anteriorly and the oblique sinus posteriorly. Well, this is a cadaveric picture uh, from uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, it's very nicely, uh, it illustrates the uh, transverse sinus. This finger is introduced in the transverse sinus. This is the ascending aorta. This is the pulmonary trunk. This is the right auricle, and here the left auricle is not well seen. This uh, other picture shows the hand pushed into the oblique sinus of pericardium behind the heart. Now we'll come to the supply of the pericardium. The fibrous and parietal pericardium are considered as one entity, while the visceral the pericardium is considered as another entity. Uh, the fibrous and parietal receive supply similar to somatic structures in the chest wall while the visceral pericardium receives supply similar to the supply of the heart. So arterial supply, as the heart receives coronary arteries, the visceral layer receives coronary arteries, while the parietal receives from arteries surrounding the pericardium. Behind the heart, there is the descending aorta. On each side of the heart and pericardium, running with the phrenic nerve, we have a pericardiophrenic artery. And uh, in front, we have another branch of uh, the internal thoracic artery, which is the musculophrenic. So the fibrous is supplied by three arteries, pericardiophrenic from the sides, musculophrenic from the front, and thoracic aorta, descending thoracic aorta uh, from behind. Well, uh, regarding the drainage, also, the venous drainage is coronary veins, similar to the hearts regarding the visceral pericardium, while the parietal and fibrous uh, drain into this vein in the posterior mediastinum, which is the uh, azygous vein. Regarding the nerve supply, the closest nerve to the pericardium is the phrenic nerve, so it supplies uh, the fibrous pericardium, while uh, the visceral pericardium has the heart receives autonomic blood supply. And as we said that in the pleura, uh, always uh, somatic supply is sensitive to pain, uh, while autonomic supply is insensitive to pain. So the parietal uh, pericardium is sensitive to pain, while uh, the visceral pericardium is insensitive. So when, uh, when there is inflammation of the pericardium, pericardial pain is not felt, uh, unless uh, the parietal layer is involved. Uh, the applied anatomy of the pericardium, uh, we have what is called a bare area of the pericardium. Uh, it is located anteriorly. You remember uh, when you studied the lungs that the anterior border of pleura and lung uh, on the left side deviate to the left side of the sternum 
between the fourth and sixth costal cartilage, leaving a space here. This space, uh, in this space, the pericardium is exposed to the chest wall, to the intercostal space directly. So uh, when there is accumulation of fluid or blood inside the pericardium, in general, accumulation of fluid uh, filling the pericardium is called cardiac tamponade. And uh, usually this fluid has to be drained to allow the heart to fill and contract. Uh, it is done by introducing a needle through the fourth or fifth intercostal space, that is to say just below the fourth or fifth uh, uh, costal cartilages and drain the fluid because the needle in such case will enter the pericardium without piercing the fluid. Now it's time to test uh, uh, your knowledge. Uh, I advise you to pause the video, uh, read the questions and try to answer them and play the video again to hear the answers. Well, the first question says, the pericardium is fixed in position and does not move with respiration. True or false? It is false because since the pericardium is fixed to the diaphragm, it moves down with inspiration and up with expiration. As a matter of fact, uh, the limit of movement is just one vertebra. Uh, the pericardium lies uh, oppo and the heart lies opposite the middle four thoracic vertebrae, that is to say uh, five, six, seven, and eight. And uh, when you inspire, uh, it descends uh, till six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, the second question, the left atrium is posterior to the transverse sinus, but anterior to the uh, oblique sinus. Yes, this is true. Uh, I just said that the atria, uh, especially the left, intervenes between the oblique sinus behind it uh, and the transverse sinus in front of it. So in summary, the layers are fibrous fixed in three directions. Uh, the serous is for lubrication. The two sinuses, the transverse is between the arteries anteriorly and the atria posteriorly, the oblique is behind the heart or behind the left atrium. The supply, the fibrous and parietal are considered as somatic, while the visceral is considered as the heart. Uh, the bare area of pericardium and pericardial synthesis are done on the left side of the sternum in the fourth and fifth intercostal spaces. Now, the second part of the lecture is to study the external features of the heart. Uh, in this uh, lecture, we will cover uh, the various uh, directions of the heart, its, its apex, its base, its four surfaces, and its four borders. Uh, we will uh, uh, study the surface landmarks, how these uh, borders are drawn on the surface, and we will correlate that with uh, the radiology of the X-ray. Of the chest. Well, the heart lies in the uh, middle mediastinum. Its long axis is directed downwards, forwards, and to the left. Two thirds of the heart lie on the left side of the midline, while only one third is on its right side. Well, uh, the heart looks like a four-sided uh, pyramid. It has uh, an apex to the left, and it has a base behind, as you can see here. It has four surfaces, a diaphragmatic surface below, sternocostal surface anteriorly. Uh, we have right pulmonary surface and left pulmonary surface. Here is the right, and here is the left. But they are really uh, borders, rounded borders rather than surfaces. Okay, regarding the apex, you need to know its direction, what it is formed by. It is directed downwards, forwards, and to the left. 
it is made entirely by the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, and this is the left. It is related to the pleura and lung, which separated from the chest wall, particularly the left fifth intercostal space. Regarding the base of the heart, uh, it looks like a, a, a rectangle. Uh, is directed backwards and slightly to the right. It is formed mainly by the left atrium ventricle. On the right side, very little part of the right atrium is seen, and it receives the two vena cava, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Regarding its relations, so we have this blue structure, which is the venous drainage of the heart. It's called coronary sinus. Well, uh, posteriorly, as I just said, we have the oblique sinus of the pericardium, then the fibrous pericardium, then the contents of the posterior mediastinum, which will separate uh, the heart from the middle four thoracic vertebrae. Uh, in fact, the, uh, this position, as uh, I just uh, mentioned early, is not fixed. Uh, the middle four thoracic vertebrae uh, are when you are lying down or during expiration. But during inspiration, the heart descends one vertebra below, and also when standing, it descends one vertebra below. Well, uh, now uh, the sternocostal surface of the heart, uh, as you can see here, uh, you can see uh, mostly uh, ventricles, very little atria. Uh, the old picture uh, that you are used to uh, in the past that the, eight, the two atria lie above and the two ventricles lie below is not correct. Uh, uh, the ventricles are anterior and the atria are posterior in reality. Uh, well, you have to know the direction of the surface is directed forwards, slightly uh, upwards and slightly to the left. Uh, what it is made of. Uh, you can see that it's made of two portions, uh, a small atrial portion above and to the right, a large ventricular portion below and uh, to the left. They are separated from each other by uh, a coronary sulcus or an atrioventricular uh, groove. It's called coronary because it contains the right coronary artery. Uh, in this uh, surface, the uh, most of the atrial portion is made by the right atrium, which receives the superior vena cava and the inferior uh, vena cava. Uh, we see only the tip of the left auricle projecting here on the left side. Right. Is hidden uh, by the uh, transverse sinus of pericardium and the two arteries uh, in front of it. Uh, the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Uh, the ventricular portion is made mostly by the right ventricle. As a matter of fact, the right ventricle most, uh, forms most of the uh, sternocostal surface, and a very little part is made by the left ventricle, which makes also the apex. Uh, the two ventricles are separated by a groove called anterior interventricular groove because it contains an artery called anterior interventricular artery. Uh, the relations of this uh, surface is to uh, uh, the sternum, the costal cartilages, the intercostal spaces separated from them by the pleura and lung, except the, in the bare area of the pericardium where the left pleura and lung deviate in the fourth and fifth intercostal spaces. Well, uh, the, uh, the third surface is the uh, diaphragmatic uh, surface. Uh, it faces uh, downwards and uh, backwards, uh, slightly to the right. Uh, it's made of the two ventricles only. 
So you can see that the base is made by the two atria, the, vent the, the phragmatic surface is made by the two ventricles, mostly by the left ventricle, to a slight extent by the right ventricle, and uh, they are separated from each other by the posterior interventricular groove. Uh, its relation is to the diaphragm. Well, uh, we will now uh, study the surface landmarks uh, and the borders of the heart. Uh, how can you mark them on uh, your chest wall? And this relation to the uh, chest X-ray, this is uh, the real heart in relation to the radiology, in relation to the chest. Okay. Uh, we mark four points on the chest wall. The first one is on the lower border of the uh, left second uh, poster cartilage. The second one uh, is on the upper border of the right third costal cartilage. And the third point was, is on the uh, right sixth costal cartilage. The fourth point is in the place of the apex uh, in the left fifth intercostal space. Uh, these three points are one and a half inches from the edge of the sternum, while the last one is nine centimeters from uh, the uh, edge uh, of the stem. And now we connect the points to make the four borders of the heart. Uh, the upper border is straight. Uh, the lower border is slightly concave or straight. Uh, the left border and the right border are convex. Uh, what is each border made of? As you can see here, the right border is made by the right atrium. So when you see the right border of the cardiac silhouette here, uh, it is made by the right atrium. Uh, how about the left border? The left border is mostly made by the left ventricle except uh, this very little part by the left auricle. Uh, this is called the waist of the heart, the part made by the left auricle. Just above this, the large vessels make two projections here. Uh, the first one above here is made by the junction of the arch of aorta with the descending aorta. It's called the aortic knuckle. And the... Uh, uh, bulge just below it is called pulmonary cords. So on the left border of the cardiac silhouette, you have the aortic knuckle with pulmonary conus. This is the waist of the heart made by the left auricle, and this is the left border. Uh, this is called cardiophrenic angle, left cardiophrenic angle, or obtuse angle. This is the uh, right cardiophrenic angle, which is called the acute angle. Uh, now uh, we have to make the atrioventricular groove or the coronary groove. Uh, it extends from the left third costal cartilage at its junction with the uh, sternum to the sixth costal cartilage at right sixth costal cartilage at its junction with the sternum. From this point, you can draw a line parallel to the left border. It's, it's the anterior interventricular groove separating the left ventricle from the right. Well, uh, let's now see uh, the four positions of the valves. These are the actual positions, but the oscillatory areas are not on the actual position of the hearts. Uh, the uh, valves are, uh, the first one is the pulmonary, and the second one is aortic. Uh, third one is mitral. The fourth one is the tricuspid, MT. Uh, they are located opposite the third costal cartilage, third space, fourth costal cartilage, fourth space. Three, three, four, four. Uh, horizontally, where they are located, uh, the pulmonary is not related to the sternum, it's related to the costal cartilage to the left side of the sternum. Uh, the three others are related to the left half of the sternum. Uh, the aortic to the left edge of the sternum, the mitral to the left half of the body of the sternum, 
the tricuspid to the center of the sternum. Uh, their position are uh, horizontal, oblique, oblique, vertical. So if you want to remember, remember PAM T3344. Well, the sites of auscultation of the four uh, valves are shown on the picture now. The pulmonary radiates blood in this direction, so it is here, it's heard in the left second uh, intercostal space close to the sternum. The aortic, the aorta pushes blood in this direction in the ascending, then on the arch, so it's, uh, it's better heard in the right second uh, intercostal space uh, close to the sternum. The mitral is heard over the apex, left fifth intercostal space, uh, just below the left nipple. Uh, and the tricuspid is heard here uh, uh, behind the lower part of the sternum. And as we said, this is the cardiac silhouette. Uh, this is the obtuse border, and this is the acute border. Now it's time for self-test. Uh, I advise you to uh, pause the video, uh, try to answer the two questions, uh, and then play the video to hear the answers. Well, uh, on the left side, this picture uh, shows the external surface of the uh, heart uh, from a top view. Uh, and showing also the sternocostal surface. And number one here uh, points to the uh, right auricle. Number two is the ascending aorta. Three is the superior vena cava entering the right atrium. Four, the left uh, atrium. Five is the superior left pulmonary uh, vein. Six is the auricle of the left atrium. Seven is the pulmonary trunk. And I'll stop here to show something nice. Uh, if you put your finger here between the pulmonary trunk and the left auricle, it will go into this slit, which is in front of the two atria and behind the two arteries. Yes, this is the transverse sinus of pericardium. Your finger will go out here between the ascending aorta and the uh, right auricle. So you can say that anteriorly you have the two arteries, posteriorly you have the two atria. Uh, in order to uh, get your uh, finger inside this uh, transverse sinus, you have to go uh, between an artery and an auricle, between an artery and an auricle. Okay, uh, we stopped at seven. Now, uh, eight is the uh, left uh, ventricle, nine is the right ventricle, 10 is the right coronary artery. Now let's answer the question on the right, uh, whether the statement is true or false. All heart valves are retrosternal. Remember we said three, three, four, four. Well, the first one is P, uh, PAM T. The P is pulmonary. The pulmonary is not retrosternal. The three others are retrosternal. One at the left edge, one behind the left half of sternum, and the last one is behind the center of sternum. So this is incorrect. Well, mitral valve is best heard at the left edge of sternum in the fifth left intercostal space. Well, fifth intercostal space is correct, but the left edge of sternum, no, it, it is away from the sternum by nine uh, centimeters. Uh, the base of the heart is mainly made by the left atrium. Yes, this is correct. Now let's revise what we have said about uh, the external appearance of the heart. Uh, in this section, 
Uh, you may be asked what uh, uh, the right border is made of, uh, what is the chamber that mostly makes the sternocostal surface, what makes the apex, and so on, or uh, uh, the surface landmarks of these uh, features. So at first, the apex, it's made by the left ventricle only. It's located in the left fifth intercostal space, uh, just below the left nipple, uh, the base. Uh, is made mainly by the left atrium. It's located opposite the middle four uh, thoracic vertebrae. Uh, the right border is made uh, by the uh, right atrium and the two vena cavi. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it extends from the uh, right third costal cartilage to the right uh, six, one and a half inches from the sternum. Uh, the uh, left border is made mainly by the left ventricle uh, and a little extend by the left uh, auricle. Uh, it extends from the second uh, costal cartilage on the left side to the apex. Uh, the sternocostal surface, uh, it is uh, made mainly by the right ventricle. Uh, it's located between the four borders of the heart. The diaphragmatic surface is made mainly by the left uh, ventricle. And the valves are located uh, uh, in this arrangement, uh, PAM-T-3344. Uh, now, this is the third section of this uh, uh, lecture. It deals with the internal structure of the heart. What you need to know about the internal structure of the heart uh, are uh, the structures or features seen in each uh, chamber, uh, the uh, valves of the heart, and what we call the fibroskeleton. Now we will study the interior of the right atrium. If we look on the outside of the right atrium, we can see here a groove between the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. This groove is called sulcus terminalis. It appears to separate two parts of the atrium, a smooth posterior part and a rough anterior part that will appear when we open uh, the wall of the right atrium. Here we opened uh, the wall. Uh, we removed most of the rough part, but uh, remaining only a small part in this uh, auricle. By, uh, the site of the sulcus terminalis is marked inside by the pista terminalis, which contains the SA node or the pacemaker of the heart. Uh, the rough part contains these uh, trabeculi that are called musculi pectinitae. The smooth part is derived from the sinus venosus and is called venous sinus. It receives many openings. Uh, its outlet is the tricuspid orifice that we can see here that leads blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle. It has three cusps. Uh, this is an anterior cusp. This is the posterior cusp. And this is the septal cusp. When it is open, it's the uh, opening appears e sheet. Uh, the inlets to the atrium include the opening of coronary sinus, it's guarded by a valve, the opening of inferior vena cava, which is also guarded by a, a valve. Anything that drains against gravity needs a valve to separate the blood column uh, into segments. Uh, there is the opening of the superior vena cava, which has no valve, as this vein drains with gravity. This part is the interatrial septum that separates the right atrium from the left atrium. Uh, it shows an embryonic remnant here. It's called fossa ovalis, which represents the site of the uh, foramen ovale in the uh, embryo. And it is surrounded above and on the anterior and posterior border by an annulus ovalis or limbus fossa ovalis.
Now we will study the interior of the right ventricle. Here we open its wall. We can see that it's made of two parts. An inlet from the tricuspid valve to the cavity. This looks rough. And an outlet leading to the pulmonary valve, which looks smooth and is called the pulmonary conus. Uh, between the two, there is a ridge called supraventricular crest. Now, if we look at the tricuspid valve from below, we can see that it has an anterior cusp, a posterior cusp, and a septal cusp. These cusps lead to these filaments, which are called cordi. Tendini, and these cordi tendini appear to arise from papillary muscles. There are three papillary muscles in the right ventricle an anterior papillary, a posterior papillary, and a septal papillary. Same names as the cusps. But you have to notice that not each papilla is attached to its cusp only, but each uh, papilla or papillary muscle is attached to two adjacent cusps, so that, for example, the septal is attached to the septal and the posterior. The posterior is attached to the posterior and the anterior. The anterior uh, papillary muscles or the anterior papillary muscles, it's called the tendini, are attached to the anterior and septal uh, cusps. Uh, notice that when uh, uh, the opening of the tricuspid valve is opened, as during diastole, uh, the, op the opening of the pulmonary valve is closed. Um, so the opening of the tricuspid opens so that blood enters inside the cavity of the right uh, ventricle. Later on, as the ventricle contracts, these cusps close and to prevent them from uh, getting back, opening back into the atrium so that blood will return to the atrium, these cordi tendini pull on the edges of the cusps, keeping them touching each other and closing the opening. Uh, when the tricuspid valve is closed during uh, systole, all the blood in the right ventricle will pass through the open pulmonary valve. Uh, this uh, uh, wall is smooth, but however, uh, the rough part, in addition to the large papillary muscle, uh, contain uh, these uh, trabeculi, uh, muscular trabeculi, which are called the trabeculi carni. Carni uh, means meat, flesh. Uh, there is also another feature here in the uh, right ventricle, which is this uh, trabecula or uh, band that connects the septum with the base of the anterior papillary muscle. It's called the moderator band or the septomarginal trabecula. It contains the right branch of the uh, bundle office. Now we will study the interior of the left atrium. As you can see here, this is the left receiving the four pulmonary uh, veins. Now its wall is opened, so we can see it's inside. Uh, characteristically, it looks smoother than the uh, right atrium. Uh, only some musculi pectinitae are present in the uh, auricle. Uh, we can see uh, also here the mitral valve. Its opening is slit-like because it has only two cusps, an anterior cusp and a posterior cusp. Uh, when we look at the interatrial septum between the left atrium and the right atrium, uh, we can see uh, an inverted uh, crescent here uh, and a depression uh, similar to the fossa ovalis on the right side.
Now we will study the interior of the left ventricle. Its wall is open to see its cavity. Uh, we can see that uh, it has an inlet or inflowing part, which is rough, and an outflowing part, which is smooth and called vestibule. Same as in case of the uh, right ventricle. Uh, in the inflowing part, this is the mitral uh, valve that separates the left ventricle from the uh, left atrium. This is the anterior cusp. Remember, this is anterior here, and this is posterior. This is the anterior cusp, and this is the posterior cusp. These are trabeculae carni. They are uh, finer and more numerous than uh, in the case of the right ventricle. Uh, the chordae tendini here lead to two papillary muscles. Uh, an anterior, this is it, was attached to the removed uh, muscular wall, and a posterior attached to the posterior wall. Uh, these are the chordae tendini, and of course, there is no moderator band inside. Uh, the aortic valve here uh, leads to the ascending aorta. Uh, one thing remains that we uh, have to know, that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve separates the inflowing part from the outflowing part. And that blood passes in a V-shaped direction, at first downwards, forwards, and to the left, and then upwards, backwards, and to the right. Uh, if we compare a cut section of the left ventricle uh, with that with the right ventricle, we are here looking from uh, the inferior aspect, uh, we can see that the wall of the left ventricle is three times thicker than the wall of the uh, right ventricle. Also, we can see that the interventricular septum is curved. Uh, it bulges towards the right side so that the cavity of the left ventricle is circular in cross-section, uh, whereas that of the right ventricle is triangular in a cross-section. Uh, the interventricular septum is made of two parts. The lower part is muscular and called septum musculari. Uh, while the upper part is membranous and is called septum membranation, uh, it is made of two parts. Uh, the anterior part separates the two ventricles. That's why it is called interventricular. Whereas its posterior part separates the left ventricle, not from the right ventricle, but from the right atrium. How can this happen? That's because uh, the AV ring that separates the atrium from the ventricle on the right side is a bit lower on the right side than on the left side. Uh, the cavity of the right atrium faces the left atrium and the left ventricle as well. Now we will study the cardiac valves. Uh, but before that, we need to orient ourselves to this view of the heart. Uh, this is a top uh, and back view showing the right and left atria, uh, the right receiving the superior and the inferior vena cava, the left receiving uh, the two right and two left pulmonary veins. This is the ascending aorta, and this is the pulmonary trunk dividing into left and right uh, pulmonary uh, arteries. Uh, we have two types of valves. Those between the atria and ventricles, the one on the right is the uh, tricuspid valve, that's its site, and the one on the left is the uh, mitral valve, and this is its site. Uh, this is marked blue because it transmits unoxygenated blood. This is marked red because it transmits oxygenated blood. Uh, the two other valves are the semilunar valves. Uh, the one for the aorta, its position is below the ascending aorta, and the one uh, of the pulmonary trunk uh, is located here. Uh, so we have to make a cut here 
separating the atria and the two big arteries from the ventricles. We will look at the top view on the ventricles at the site of the atrioventricular ring uh, or coronary uh, groove. Here we are. Now we can see clearly this is the tricuspid orifice and this is the mitral orifice. Uh, this is the aortic orifice and this is the pulmonary orifice. Now, let's compare between the two uh, AV valves. Uh, the tricuspid has three cusps, anterior, posterior, and septal, whereas the mitral has only two cusps, anterior and posterior. The cavity of the tricuspid transmits three fingers, uh, whereas that of the mitral transmits only two fingers. Uh, the cavity, when it's open, it looks triangular. Uh, the cavity, when it's open, is circular or oval. Uh, in each valve, there is a fibrous uh, ring around called annulus fibrosus. Uh, there are two surfaces for the valves. The upper surface or the atrial surface is uh, smooth. The ventricular surface and the margin of the valve uh, gives uh, attachment to the cordy uh, tendini. Uh, each papillary muscle gives cordy tendini to two uh, adjacent cusps, as we have said before. And uh, between the uh, cusps near the fibrous ring, the cusps are adherent to each other and this is called commissure of the cusp. If the commissure is large, the cusp, uh, the valve becomes narrowed uh, or stenosed. Now we will see the two semilunar uh, valves. Uh, each of them has three cusps, but their positions are uh, different. In the case of the uh, pulmonary, we have one posterior cusp and two anterior. Remember, pulmonary starts with a P, and it has one posterior. Uh, in the case of the aorta, it starts with an A. We have one anterior. That's the way you can memorize it. Pulmonary, one posterior. Aorta, one anterior. Above each cusp, there is a dilatation called sinus. So there is an anterior aortic sinus and two posterior aortic sinuses. The anterior and the left posterior give origin to two coronary arteries, the right coronary and the left coronary. Uh, the diameter of the uh, uh, opening of the pulmonary is uh, uh, about three centimeter, whereas that of the uh, aorta is two and a half centimeters. The right uh, uh, valves have larger diameter than the left. If we closely look at uh, uh, the semilunar cusps, uh, we see that at the point of meeting where they touch each other, uh, there is a thickening called nodule at the edge of the cusp. Okay. Uh, while the, mar the lateral parts of the edge of the cusp are called leonure. Now, uh, let's see the function of the cusps. Uh, when you look at the cusps, you see them. When you see the uh, uh, AV valves open, at that time, the semilunars are closed. This is diastole. When you see the uh, AV valves closed, you see the semilunars open and this is in system. Now we will study the, uh, what's called the fibroskeleton of the heart. If we dissect the AV uh, ring uh, carefully, uh, we will separate fibrous structures that are not muscular. Purely fibrous uh, structures here, these include uh, the four fibrous rings of the uh, valves, uh, the one anteriorly here is the pulmonary. The one next to it is the uh, aortic. 
Uh, this is the mitral ring, and this is the tricuspid. Uh, in addition, we have two fibrous uh, trigones related to the uh, mitral uh, orifice or the uh, aorta. Uh, this is the left fibrous trigone, and this is the right fibrous trigone. Well, what are the functions of this uh, fibroskeleton? Uh, the main function is they make an electric isolation between the atria and the ventricles. Atrial uh, impulses are so rapid, uh, while ventricular contractions are much slower. If the atrial rate is transmitted to the ventricles, uh, it will cause a, a great uh, harm. Uh, only one structure passes through this fibrous ring to transmit uh, electric stimulation from the atria to the ventricles. This is the atrioventricular bundle that we will discuss uh, lately when we start studying the, uh, uh, the uh, conducting system. They also give muscle attachments. They give attachment to muscle fibers of the atria are behind, the ventricles are in front. They also keep latency of the uh, valves and they give attachment to the cusps. Now it's time to test our knowledge. Uh, we have two questions here. Uh, please pause the uh, video, try to answer yourself, and then play the video again. Now, uh, these are the answers. Uh, on the left side here, we have a picture of an open right ventricle. Uh, number one uh, points to the uh, one of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. It's the anterior cusp. Okay, number two, cordy tendini, three, posterior papillary muscle, four, anterior papillary muscle, five, moderator band, six, interventricular septum, seven, septal papillary muscle, eight, uh, uh, conus arteriosus or infundibulum of pulmonary trunk. Now, on the right side, let's see whether the statements are true or false. Cordi tendini attached to aortic and pulmonary valves. No. Cordi tendini attached to the atrioventricular valves. Each ventricle contains three papillary muscles. No, only the right ventricle contains three, while the left ventricle contains two. The cresta terminalis is seen in the left atrium. You have to uh, be aware it's in the right atrium and not the left atrium. The muscular interventricular septum separates the ventricles only. Well, this question is a bit uh, tricky. Uh, we know that if we don't have the word muscular, it's wrong because part of the septum, the membranous part, which is posterior, separates uh, the atrium from the ventricle, the right atrium from the left ventricle. But however, the muscular part, yes, it separates the two ventricles only, so this is correct. So in summary, we said that in the right atrium, it's made of two parts by the crista terminalis, smooth and rough. The smooth has uh, several openings, uh, and uh, we had two features in the septum, uh, which are the fossa ovalis and annulus ovalis. In the right ventricle, it's also divided into two parts by the supraventricular uh, crest. It has only two openings. Uh, the outflowing part leads to the uh, uh, pulmonary orifice, while the inflowing part is uh, beginning with the tricuspid orifice, we have three papillary muscles and a moderator band plus cordy tendini. Left atrium is smooth. Uh, it has uh, five openings, four for the pulmonary valves, and one is the mitral orifice. Left ventricle, its wall is thicker, it's circular, it's smoother. Uh, it has uh, two. 
Now we come to the fourth part of this uh, lecture, which is about the coronary blood supply to the heart. Uh, we will cover the arteries and the veins. Regarding the arteries, uh, you have to know the origin, the course, the branches and distribution of the two coronary arteries. And regarding the veins, you have to know the course and the drainage. Well, we will start with the coronary arteries. Uh, we'll see uh, their origin and uh, course. Uh, we have two coronary arteries, right coronary artery and a left coronary artery. Uh, the origin of the right coronary artery is from the anterior sinus of the uh, ascending aorta. It runs in the uh, right part of the atrioventricular groove, winds around the inferior border of the heart to reach the posterior atrioventricular groove, where it ends by uh, anastomosing with the left coronary artery. The left coronary starts from the left posterior aortic sinus, it is larger than the right. It runs shortly in the AV groove and divides into two terminal branches. Anterior interventricular artery, or uh, the left anterior descending, or LED, it descends in the anterior interventricular groove to reach the apex of the heart, where it winds uh, to end by anastomosing uh, with the posterior interventricular artery. The other branch is the circumflex artery, which winds around the left border of the heart to reach the posterior uh, atrioventricular groove, and it ends by anastomosing with the right coronary artery. The site of anastomosis between the two coronary arteries to form an arterial ring at the junction of the uh, atria and ventricle, or in the AV groove. This junction, posteriorly here, is called the crux. Well, now let's see the branches of the uh, coronary arteries. Uh, the right coronary gives a right conal branch that supplies the conus arteriosus. Sometimes it arises separately from the ascending aorta, and therefore it's called third coronary. It gives a branch to the SA node, to the atria, it goes between the auricle and the ascending aorta to reach towards the superior vena cava. It supplies the atrium and supplies the SA node in 65% of cases. The SA node is located near the mouth of the superior vena cava. Uh, it gives uh, ventricular branches and it gives what's called the uh, right marginal branch or the acute marginal uh, branch, which runs along the inferior border of the heart. After it winds uh, to reach the posterior surface, uh, before it ends, it gives an AV nodal branch to uh, the AV node, which lies in the interatrial septum. Uh, this occurs in 80% of cases, and it gives a descending branch or posterior interventricular or posterior descending branch, PDA, uh, which ends by uh, just before uh, the apex by anastomosis with the anterior interventricular artery. Branches of the uh, left, uh, the anterior interventricular artery, it gives a left conal branch. Sometimes it anastomoses with the right conal branch to form an anastomosis here, and it gives conal branches uh, to uh, the left ventricle. The circumflex branch gives the obtuse marginal branch or left marginal branch, uh, and it uh, uh, compensates if the right coronary does not supply the SA node or AV node. Uh, so it gives uh, supply to the SA node uh, in 35% of cases and to the AV node in 20% of cases. That's where uh, 
uh, it runs in the posterior interventricular groove, supplies the AV node here and supplies the SC node here. Well, regarding the anastomosis between these two arteries, uh, we just said that both of them, they make a ring in the AV groove, okay, or the coronary groove. Also, there are two more rings or two loops. One, which is the interventricular loop between the anterior interventricular artery and the posterior interventricular artery, and the marginal loop between the two marginal branches, the obtuse marginal and the acute marginal. Sometimes there is a third loop here between the conal branch of the right coronary and the conal branch of the left coronary. Now we'll talk about what's called uh, uh, coronary dominance. Uh, the posterior interventricular artery is usually a branch of the uh, uh, right coronary. Uh, so it is uh, given uh, before the crux. Uh, this is called right dominance and it occurs in 60% of individuals. Sometimes there is left dominance, uh, as in this picture. In such case, uh, the left coronary is the one that, sub that gives the posterior interventricular artery, and uh, uh, it anastomoses in the uh, crux to uh, the uh, right side of the posterior interventricular artery. Sometimes there is what's called balanced dominance. Here, the origin of the posterior interventricular artery is at the crux. That's where the two arteries anastomose and both of them share in its formation. Sometimes it's a single artery, sometimes it's a network of arteries. Now let's come to the veins. Most of the venous drainage of the heart goes to the coronary sinus, which runs in the posterior part of the atrioventricular groove. Uh, it ends by opening into the uh, right uh, atrium. It receives three cardiac veins. A great cardiac vein, which runs with the anterior interventricular artery along the anterior interventricular groove, okay? and it winds around the left border to end in the end of the uh, coronary sinus. Uh, the middle cardiac vein, this runs in the posterior interventricular groove with the posterior interventricular artery and ends just at the end of the coronary sinus before it opens into the right atrium. Uh, we have a small cardiac vein. Uh, it receives the uh, 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 acute marginal and runs in the posterior interventricular to also end in the uh, coronary sinus just before it opens into the right atrium. Uh, there are uh, two more uh, veins, uh, a posterior vein of left ventricle and an oblique vein of uh, left uh, atrium. These are the tributaries of the coronary sinus. Uh, in addition, uh, we have uh, uh, other uh, cardiac veins. We have anterior cardiac veins, two or three, that uh, run on the uh, uh, right ventricle to open directly into the right atrium. And we have veins that uh, drain the wall of all the chambers into the cavities of all the chambers. These are called veni cordis menini or sebaceous veins. Now let's test our knowledge. Let's see if this, uh, these statements are true or false. Well, the first statement uh, says that it is possible to have two, three, or four coronary arteries. Of course, it is true. Uh, the coronal branch of the right coronary is uh, the one. The left coronary artery is usually the non-dominant, but the larger. Yes. The left is larger. It is not the dominant in 60% of cases, but it is larger, thus it supplies greater muscle mass of the heart. That's why uh, left uh, uh, coronary ischemia is uh, more serious than right coronary ischemia. 
The posterior interventricular branch may be represented by a network of vessels originating from both coronaries, yes, two, during angina pectoris due to a right coronary artery insufficiency. It is quite likely to have conduction defect rather than ECG evidence of myocardial infarction. Yes, evidence of myocardial infarction in the right is uh, not. Uh, uh, the last one is uh, during myocardial infarction due to left coronary artery insufficiency, it is possible to hear a mitral incompetence murmur over the apex. Well, uh, how can we get an incompetence in the mitral valve? Uh, probably due to infarction of a papillary muscle, uh, leading to cut of uh, uh, the cord tendini. In such case, the, uh, uh, the, fla the flaps of the uh, mitral uh, valve uh, may uh, uh, pass to the uh, atrium during ventricular contraction, causing valve incompetence. So this statement is true. So in summary of the coronary uh, supply uh, regarding the arteries, we said that uh, they arise from the uh, aortic sinuses, the right from the anterior sinus, uh, while the left from the left posterior sinus, uh, the right in the right coronary groove winds to end in the crux, um, while the left divides into anterior interventricular and circumflex, which ends in the crux, the anterior inter interventricular crosses the border to anastomose with the posterior interventricular on the inferior surface of the uh, heart. Uh, uh, the uh, distribution, the one that supplies the SA node and AV node is mostly the right. Regarding the dominance, usually we have right dominance that the coronary artery supplies uh, the uh, uh, posterior interventricular. Uh, sometimes we have left dominance from the left, sometimes we have balanced dominance from both. Uh, and we said that the anastomosis is in the form of a circle and two loops, an interventricular loop and a marginal loop, and sometimes there is a conal loop as well. Uh, regarding the veins, we said that the coronary sinus receives five veins, three uh, cardiac veins, the great, the middle, the small, okay, and the oblique vein of left atrium, posterior vein of uh, left uh, ventricle, uh, where we have uh, direct veins, anterior cardiac veins to the right uh, atrium, and veni cordis minimi to all the chambers. Now we come to the last uh, part of this lecture, which are uh, the muscular and the nervous controls of the uh, in this uh, lecture, we will cover the conducting system, which is the muscular control of the heart beating and the nerve uh, supply of the heart, which forms what's called cardiac plexuses. Well, regarding the conduction system of the heart, uh, it starts with the pacemaker or the sinoatrial node or SA node. It is located here. Uh, it is located in the upper part of the crista uh, terminalis near the mouth of the superior vena cava. It's about one to two centimeters uh, long. It lies near to the uh, epicardium rather than the endocardium, so it is sub-epicardial. It consists of P cells or pale cells surrounding a central artery. Uh, there are three bundles, internodal bundles in the atrium uh, that connect the SA node with the AV node. And there is uh, one bundle that goes from the right uh, atrium to the left uh, atrium. It's called Bachmann bundle. Uh, the AV node is located in the interatrial septum here uh, in a triangle called Koch triangle. Uh, uh, here it is. That's its position. It's very important for uh, cardiologists who do uh, electrophysiology because they do ablations of these uh, parts if there is ectopic foci in them. Uh, and uh, the AV bundle actually delays uh, the rhythm uh, that is transmitted from the uh, atrium to the ventricles because the atria beat faster than the ventricles. So it delays uh, the conduction. 
the AV bundle uh, goes through the uh, fibrous ring of the of the fibroskeleton of the heart. Uh, it is the only uh, normal pathway from the atria to the ventricles because the fibroskeleton acts as an insulator, preventing transmission of electricity from the atria to the ventricles. However, there are sometimes uh, other bundles, abnormal bundles, which lead to what's called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, it divides at the upper border of the muscular interventricular septum, so it descends in the, uh, uh, the membranous septum, and at the upper border of the muscular septum, it divides. It gives a right branch, which is usually single, and a left branch, which divides uh, and is uh, multiple. Uh, the right branch does not reach to the apex of the right ventricle. It goes through the moderator band to the base of the anterior capillary muscle. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, the left branch is multiple and divides into multiple bands, but it reaches the apex of the left ventricle. So the main difference between the right and left is that the right is single, the left is multiple, the right does not reach the apex. The left reaches the apex, and finally, they end in specialized muscle fibers in the myocardium called Purkinje fibers. Uh, as I said, in Wilf Parkinson White syndrome, abnormal bundles cross the fibroskeleton. Well, regarding the nerve supply, we have a superficial cardiac plexus and the deep cardiac plexus. Where they are located, well, here is the trachea and its bifurcation called the carina. That's where the deep cardiac plexus is uh, located in front of this carina. This is the arch of aorta. These are the two pulmonary arteries. The left pulmonary artery is connected to the arch of aorta ligamentum arteriosum, which is the remnant of the ductus arteriosus. Just in front of this ligamentum arteriosum uh, lies the superficial cardiac plexus. As you can see here, they are very close to each other. Well, uh, what are these plexuses made of? Vagus and sympathetic. Well, uh, regarding the sympathetic, we have three sympathetic ganglia in the neck. Each of them gives a cardiac branch. And we have the vagus nerve in the neck. It gives also two cardiac branches, a superior branch and an inferior branch. So from the neck, we have uh, sympathetic cardiac branches, superior, middle, inferior, and we have two vagal cardiac branches, superior and inferior. Only two from the left side go to the superficial cardiac plexus. The rest from the left side and from the right side go to the deep cardiac plexus. Which ones go to the superficial cardiac plexus? The superior sympathetic cervical cardiac and the inferior vagal cervical cardiac branch. Remember, sympathetic superior, both start with an S. Sympathetic gives the superior, the vagal gives the inferior. The other cardiac branches, together with all the cardiac branches on the left side, from the neck and from the thorax, right, go to the deep cardiac plexus. In addition to uh, all these branches, both recurrent laryngeal nerves share in the deep cardiac plexus. You have to remember that uh, uh, the action of the sympathetic is to enhance a heart contraction, whereas the vagus depresses cardiac functions. Now it's time to uh, answer some questions. Uh, please pause the video, uh, answer by yourself, and then replay the video to hear the answers. Okay, um, the first statement, the atrioventricular node enhances atrioventricular conduction. Wrong. Delays it. The right branch of the bundle of his reaches the apex of the heart. No, the left one is the one that reaches the apex. Typically, the atrioventricular bundle is the sole pathway of conduction across the fibrous 
atrioventricular ring, this is true, typically, or in normal conditions. Only in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome that we have uh, abnormal bundles. Uh, the moderator band carries uh, the right bundle branch. This is true. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we said that uh, the site of each conducting structure you have to remember. Uh, the SA node is in the crista terminalis, the AV node in the AV septum, in the Koch triangle. Uh, the main bundle is in the fibroskeleton and the membranous interventricular septum. The branches are on the sides of the uh, uh, muscular interventricular septum subendocardially. Uh, we have two plexuses. The superficial plexus is, uh, has two contributions uh, from the left side. Uh, the superior sympathetic and the inferior vagal branches that arise in the neck. Now we reach the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you like uh, these lectures, please subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel and uh, hit like. Thanks again.